Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and a pleasure to be seated with um, Mr. McCarthy, the, who I knew only by reputation uh, before today. And it's a pleasure to be here with him um, and the good work that he represents uh, for the people of the United States <clears throat> in his efforts, um, especially in, uh, during the War on Terror. Um, Thank you, sir. And um, uh, Hans and I go back uh, to our service at the Justice Department when we were on the same team together working on uh, election reform, and it was his uh, skill and knowledge that made my uh, efforts as the special counsel for election reform. He served as the deputy. Uh, we later served uh, several assistant attorney generals um, <clears throat> as senior counsel, and uh, appearing with him today is, is a great honor for me. Um, and last, but certainly not least, is Ms. Ibarra. Uh, Ms. Ibarra is an authentic refugee from, from, from Cuba and from communism and from Castro. Uh, the three C's in Miami, um, and um, uh, she never lost a case in front of me, and there's a reason for that. Um, she is an excellent lawyer. Uh, obviously, as she would tell you, she chose her case as well, but then once she got into court, uh, she was a fierce advocate, uh, and in close cases, advocacy can make the difference between a win and a loss, and uh, it was always a pleasure to have her in my courtroom. She's the, the epitome uh, of an advocate, and uh, some people will speak up, but few people will go to jail. Uh, and she was willing to, to go to jail on behalf of Elian Gonzalez, and uh, uh, not only get willing to go to jail, but to go to trial. And uh, she was rightfully acquitted, and um, that, uh, more than anything else, I think uh, says um, so much about her character that um, it, it reveals more than just her ability as, uh, as, an, as an attorney, but also... Um, her um, character. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the book. Um, uh, it goes about eight chapters. You all have got uh, roughly 12 pages in front of you, condensed in 10-point type uh, with, with some uh, very uh, full end notes. Um, there's a lot there, and there's a lot to get your arms around because there's a lot about immigration that, that, uh, that can't be, can't be um, um, dissolved or reduced uh, to uh, book forms. Um, volumes have been written about immigration. Uh, and, and so what I'm going to tell you today is just, a, is just scratching, the, it's not even scratching the surface. Um, we have the greatest immigration system in the world. Let's put it, get that out there immediately. We take into the United States each year, legally, more people than the rest of the world combined. That's how robust our immigration system is on the legal side. And it says loads about us as a nation. Lots of good things. Between 1840 and 2006, 72 million people legally immigrated to the United States. That betrays three confidences, or dis dis displays three confidences. One, our confidence in those who arrive on our shores. Two, their confidence in us. And three, our confidence in the process that we've adopted to keep our nation growing in the right way. 25% uh, of the Union Army was foreign born. 5% of today's armed forces are those who were born outside the United States. 20% of the Congressional Medal of Honor holders, 716 out of 3,400, were born outside the United States. A 2006 census report showed that of those who, uh, who had, were foreign born in the United States, 56% of them uh, had incomes between 37,000 and more than, slightly more than $90,000 a year. People who come here the right way come here to prosper. And those who, many of those who enter today, uh, not the right way, uh, especially given the, the drug cartel information that we all know about have come here to profit here. Others are victims of persecution, and Mrs. Ibarra can, as she can better testify to that than I. Uh, others are fleeing the lack of clean drinking water, lack of education, the lack of, of crime-free streets. I'm here today not to discuss immigration as a subject on the whole, but to talk about immigration courts. And I want to tell you, you're not getting the straight story about immigration courts. It is, it's a 
These are very American courts, and it is a very American story. But it is a story, a compelling one of national purpose that is betrayed by the court reports that the Congress receives each year. And let me share these facts with you. First of all, candor is not found in the institutional DNA of EOIR or those who report it through the Justice Department. The real story of these courts and the, and, and the great work that they do is not written down. Let me share these facts with you. Prior to 9-11, on average, the five years prior to 9-11, 35% of those who were free, pinned in court, never showed. After 9-11, 50.4% of those free, those aliens free, pinned in court, never showed. We did not become safer after 9-11. We decidedly became unsafer. Out of that group, out of that 50.4 percent, there were 45,000 people from nations that sponsor terror that were released by DHS. And DHS reported that it was unlikely that they would ever be deported because they would probably never be found. And that's in the 2000 uh, uh, six report from DHS. Um, now, the failure to appear rates are important because they describe a dynamic and a trend that you don't get anywhere else. And you don't get it out of their reports. I had to dig in to figure out what they were doing. And what they were doing was this. EOIR did not measure failure to appear rates. They measured how many people are ordered removed out of everybody who came to court. And what they did was they mixed together those who were in detention, pending trial. Those people always come to court. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was they took those who were out of court, mixed those that were those that were in jail, and wonder of wonders, failure to appear rates looked very, very low. Last year, 2000, the 2009 report, which was released, of course, in 2010, said only 11 percent failed to appear. The overall failure to appear rate, the, that's, the, that's the nomenclature, that's the buzzword, that's the phrase they like to use. Uh, and, and, and they've since revised that to now just the, the failure to appear rate. They, that's, they've just defaulted to that. But historically, they used the overall failure to appear rate. Last year, they said it was 11 percent, or for 2009, they said it was 11 percent. When you take those who were free pending court and you looked at how many appeared and how many that didn't appear, 32 percent failed to appear. That's within 3 percent of those who failed to appear before 9-11. We're not making progress here. Now, grant rates are another issue. The courts historically, and this is another term that they use, advertise themselves as saying that removal orders constitute 80 percent of all orders issued by the court. That much is true. Why is that? Well, because 75 percent of those who appear before courts never file an application to remain in the United States. They're in jail. They have no, or so they claim, no avenue of relief, no persecution claim, uh, chiefly. They're interdicted at the border, and they consent to removal. They never file an application, or no, in other words, a lawsuit to remain in the United States. Well, that's what that's about. An application for relief, and that's what it's called, is nothing more than a lawsuit to remain in the United States. And so we, let's not disguise it with fancy language. It's just a lawsuit to remain in the United States. The United States charges them and says, you are removable, and they never dispute it. If they dispute it, they obviously got to be filing a lawsuit. So what happens? 80% 80, 80 of all the court orders are, in fact, removal orders. But let's forget about that 75%, and let's go to the group that does file, that do file applications to remain in the United States. When you look at that number over the last 10 years, 460,000 applications for relief from removal, in other words, lawsuits to remain in the United States were filed. How many of those were granted? The answer is 295,000 were granted, better than, slightly better than 60 percent of all applications to remain in the United States were granted. 
These are not courts that are stingy. These are courts that are generous re with relief and with a specific type of relief called a form other than asylum or called other relief in, in the court's nomenclature. And these are applications for cancellation and applications for adjustment of status. Very briefly, if you entered the United States as an asylee, but you decide there's somebody I've decided I want to marry, you change your application from that of a person seeking asylum to that of a person seeking adjustment of status. That case will go to the judge. He or she will rule on the merits of that case. That's an adjustment of status. Cancellation of removal. You're either a permanent resident who has committed crimes in the United States or you are a non-permanent resident, somebody who entered the United States illegally and has been here 10 years without getting into any trouble. That's cancellation of removal, two forms of that. Those two forms of removal, 204,000 applications filed, 153,000 applications granted. The courts grant relief 75% of the time for these forms of relief. These are not ungenerous courts. These are courts generous with relief who perceive in the merits presented by attorneys like Ms. Ibarra that there is something there that causes them to conclude that the United States and its prosecutors are wrong and that they should not be removed. 